Will you join me for the call to worship? Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. Let one generation call to the next. Our first hymn is number 299. Uh, if you want the uh, notes in front of you, there's a bunch of dark blue hymn books back there. Uh, but let's stand and sing 299, Holy, Holy, Holy. gather because of you, because of who you are. You are holy and merciful and mighty. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are set apart. You are perfect. You are the source and the end of everything that is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are strong. This world is yours. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are merciful and kind and loving to us. In our strength and, in, and especially in our weakness, you are gracious and good to us all the time, Lord. Help us as we come to worship now, to with our words as we sing, with our thoughts as we hear, with all that we are, worship you and lay ourselves before you. And Lord, when we come to celebrate your goodness, celebrate your holiness, there's things we have to face about ourselves that we do not like. You are holy, and you call us to be holy. And so often we, we wander astray from that. Lord, in things we've said and done, we've wronged others, and we've grieved your heart. We're sorry. And each of us uh, now 
comes and lays before you in silence the particular things that are burdening us this week. Have mercy, Lord. Set us free by the power of your Spirit. Free us to live our lives like your Son, Jesus Christ, to be holy as he is holy, out of your strength and your grace. This we pray in Jesus' name. And now together we share the words that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I just heard the uh, doorbell ring. Thank you. Um, in Christ, we have been forgiven. By the Spirit's power, we have been transformed. Receive this gift and know God's peace. Amen. <coughs> By the grace of God, we have received peace with God, and that means we also have received peace with one another. As a sign of this, please turn to your neighbor and share the words, the peace of Christ be with you. Our, uh, our next hymn is number 526, uh, Lift Up Your Hearts or Sing Hallelujah. Let's stand and sing together. <coughs> chapter of the book of Genesis, starting at verse 22. Uh, this is the end of a long set of stories about uh, Jacob and his brother Esau. I'll go over some of them in the sermon, uh, but let me just say the two of them have not got along very well, and, uh, and they're about to reunite after decades of bad blood. So let's listen for God speaking to us through his holy word. But first, let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and pour yourself out on us, that these words that we read may be your words to us. Open our hearts and minds to what you have to say. And Holy Spirit, afterwards, help me to preach with love and faithfulness and truth. In Jesus' name, amen.
During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives, his 11 sons, and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. Even today, the people of Israel don't eat the tendon near the hip socket because of what happened that night when the man strained the tendon of Jacob's hip. Then Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and his two servant wives. He put the servants' wives and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then Jacob went on ahead. As he approached his brother, he bowed down to the ground seven times before him. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they both wept. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And uh, for the summer, we've been reading through the sort of foundational document of Presbyterian doctrine, and it's been as exciting as it sounds. Um, we've been reading from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Excuse the old-fashioned language where it says man, not person, and things. It's 400 years old. Uh, but uh, I'll read the question, and will you uh, join me for the answer? What is sanctification? Sanctification is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. Anyone know some good stereotypes about Presbyterians? Do we want to open this can of worms? I, I honestly, nowadays, the vast majority of people have no idea what the difference is between different branches of Christianity. And there's bad things about that, there's also good things about that. But, you know, do Presbyterians have a reputation of being excitable? Not particularly, we're calm. But one positive one is uh, people of the Reformed tradition of Christianity tend to be known for their <clears throat> work ethic. You know, there's that, some, some historians write about, you know, the economic differences between countries, and one of them is the good Protestant work ethic that made a huge difference uh, over the last few hundred years. The interesting things about that theory, problems with that theory, but who cares whether it's true? We have a reputation of being good, hard-working folk. And, you know, complaining about people that don't want to work hard is a uh, wonderful pastime, mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful pastime the older that we get. Um, you know, complaining about kids these days being lazy is uh, a very common thing. And interestingly, one of the oldest themes you can find in literature, we have, we have documents that are 2,500 years old complaining about kids these days. Right? Um, they don't even speak in complete sentences anymore. 
is a document from like ancient Assyria. The kids today and their slang is, is not a new complaint. Because, you know, the generation younger than me doesn't know what we went through when we were growing up, and the, the generation older than me had it even tougher or something. But our hard work and other people's laziness is a, is a very common complaint. And there's, there's various phrases about it, right? Like, um, and they, they get theological. Who can complete this one? God helps those who help themselves. God helps those who help themselves. And there I'd like to stop. Anyone want to defend that sentence? I mean, it's true. God does help those who help themselves. But is the opposite untrue? Like God helps those who can't help themselves? That also sounds true. Maybe we could finish that sentence a little earlier. God helps. Actually, we can stop there, can't we? God helps. God helps those who need help. We have been working through the doctrine of our church, and uh, we're in a section that's about how we're saved by God's grace. Jesus' life, Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, uh, it sets us free, not because we did anything, but because, because God loves us. And as that section goes on, it's been, we've been working through, so what difference does that make? And what happens to us when God applies his grace to us by the Holy Spirit? And the answer a couple questions ago, well, we get the gifts of justification, being made right with God, adoption, being part of God's family, and today, drum roll, sanctification, which is just a fancy word for being made holy. Being made holy. It's the same word as saint, actually. And it's not a word that people are particularly comfortable with, right? Like, well, I try to follow God, but I know... Right, you, it's a fairly common thing. You might even say it about yourself or think it about yourself, right? What's a saint in, in common understanding, right? A saint is the kind of person that always does the right thing, that, that never struggles with sin of any kind, um, that's tremendously over-the-top generous because they work hard at being perfect all the time. But is that what the word saint actually means in Scripture? We just read sanctification, go back to it, oops, is a work of God's free grace. Being holy, our being holy, is a work of who? God. We are made right with God without deserving any of it. And then the rest of our life is working out getting it right. But it's not like there's God's part and our part. Which part is God involved in? The whole thing. Our learning and growing, even our working, is a gift of God's grace. And there's various beautiful writings about this in, say, the letters of, the Paul, of Paul in the New Testament. But I actually thought it was most helpful to read a story about how this works out in one man or two men or a whole community's life in the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, um, the book of Genesis story is kind of driven by two different things. 
God making promises and God blessing the people and brothers being jealous. It happens over and over. You know, there's Cain and Abel. Um, there's uh, Isaac and Ishmael. And now we've got uh, Jacob and Esau. It'll happen again with Jacob's kids. Of brothers struggling with each other over God's blessing. Now, how many of you know a man named Jacob in your life, or a kid named Jacob? Who's ever met someone named Jacob? And everyone else doesn't want to put up their hand. <laughs> Who's ever met someone named James? Yeah, it's the same name, isn't it? James is just a derivation of Jacob. Um, who's ever met someone named Esau? One? Yeah. We know there's tons of people named Jacob or James, very few Esau's. But if you read the beginning of their story, do you know who the bad guy is? It's Jacob. His name actually means grasper and kind of metaphorically trickster because he's a twin and when he's born he comes out second and he's holding his brother's heel and it seems like their whole childhood he's constantly grasping at his brother now the older son is supposed to get the blessing of God which God blessed Abraham and promised to make him a blessing and that blessing is passed on to his son Isaac with some really sad family drama over brothers Isaac and Ishmael and the blessing that was on Abraham goes to Isaac, and now Isaac is going to pass on that blessing to his older son, his favorite son, Esau. And Jacob pulls this crazy trick of like putting goat hair on his arms so he seems like his hairier brother, and going to his blind father and getting the blessing, and then skipping out of town. Now, is God's blessing something that we can steal or con or get by fraud? Probably not. But Jacob tries. And Isaac does, in fact, announce the blessing of God over his son, Jacob. And it seems like everyone accepts that that works that Jacob has the blessing of God on him. And as we go through the story, it's true. Jacob has been blessed by God. The jerk, the trickster, without deserving it, has been blessed. And his brother decides he wants to kill him for it. <laughs> so Jacob runs away. And this, uh, this trickster has now learned his lesson and with the blessing of God becomes a good person. Anyone who knows the story want to correct me on that? Jacob is a trickster and a jerk and a liar and a thief for decades after that. He, um, he cons one of his father's relatives um, out of a bunch of his sheep, but then he decides he really wants to marry one of the daughters, but he gets so drunk at his wedding night he marries the wrong woman. And he plays favorites between his wives and the same pain of favoring one set of children over the other that he comes from, he passes on to his children. Like a fam there's a family blessing and a family curse. And he, he's like, he's not even faithful to God. He and, he and his favorite wife are swiping other people's idols. They're stealing their little household gods. Does this sound like a good guy? But he's received God's blessing. There's very little that's less comfortable to us than grace. I know it's a lovely word. We use it for saying thanks at meals. We name daughters grace. But if we really think about it, it's not easy. Here's this man who hasn't worked for God's blessing at all. And who once he receives it, doesn't really live like it. 
the, the question about sanctification paints this picture of we've received the gift of God's free grace and then we're renewed in the whole person after the image of God. An image is something that you know shows what something else is like. The Israelites were told, well, we're told not to build idols, statues of gods, but we are made in God's image. We don't need a statue to see God. We are supposed to show what God is like to the world. That's what that means. That your life and my life show God. I mean, how else are people going to meet God and see God's love? I've met God, and I've seen God most often in other people. Being made holy is, is looking like God, not in features, but in love. Is Jacob living that out? Not really. Not well. He's been blessed, but he's not living like a blessing. But after decades of Jacob showing he doesn't deserve this, does God give up on him? After decades of rivalry and hate and running from his past, Jacob finally almost against his will, decides to go home and tries to make peace with his brother. But the thing that actually makes the difference isn't anything that Jacob does. The story of Jacob at the place he names Peniel is one of the more beautiful, mysterious stories in the Bible. And I could spend quite a few sermons uh, talking about the little details of that story, and still there would be this kernel of, what is going on here? A man appears and wrestles with Jacob, but then as the story goes on, it becomes clear this is God wrestling with Jacob, and God loses the wrestling match? What is going on here? But then when it looks like God's losing, he just taps Jacob on the hip, and Jacob's whole hip goes, boop. And, and it's clear that God could have won this match at any time, because of course he could. But Jacob is wrestling with God. And, and the turning point in his life is when God says, let me go. And Jacob says, I won't unless you bless me. Just sit with the mystery of this story for a moment. It's weird and strange and beautiful. And I would say Jacob hasn't just been wrestling with God for a night. I think he's been wrestling with God his whole life. And I would guess that you have too. And I know, I know that I have wrestled with our Lord. I'm not sure I've ever met anyone who follows God easily, who doesn't struggle. I'm not sure anyone, I, I, I'm not sure I've met anyone who's just sort of stumbled into holiness. Oh, this person's perfect on their own. Jacob wrestled with God. And he didn't let go. But more importantly, neither did the Lord. And Jacob was blessed, truly blessed, without deserving it, decades before. He's been living with God's blessing for years, and so have you. When did God decide to start loving you? Do you know what the Presbyterian answer to that is, by the way? When did God start loving you? 
It was sometime before, if before makes any sense, before time exists, it was sometime before God said, let there be light. God decided to love you. You have never lived without God's blessing. But we wrestle. And here Jacob receives a new name. It's the name of a nation now, God wrestler, Israel. Jacob receives a new name. And he says afterwards, now I've seen God face to face. And if you look at the next part of the story, the next chapter, when Jacob and Esau meet, with everything I've told you about the story beforehand, is the two of them hugging and weeping what you'd expect? Not at all. But Jacob the liar, Jacob the trickster, Jacob the thief, Jacob the runner has become the one who wrestles with God and God would not let him go. And suddenly where there was brokenness, there is forgiveness. Where there was hate and jealousy, there's mercy and love. If we kept going, you'd see Jacob like, saying, brother, you know, I, I want to bribe you with all my stuff. I'm so sorry for what I did. And Esau is saying, no, I'm, you don't have to. We're brothers. Everything's forgiven. It's this beautiful moment of reconciliation. It's one of those moments when the holiness and grace of God comes into our world, comes into a family, and changes the way things work. It's a holy moment. God has said that you belong to him. God has made you right through Jesus Christ. God has adopted you as his child. And God has and is and will be making you holy. God has named you a saint. Not because of what you've done, but what was the word? a work of God's free grace. Receiving a work of God's free grace has made you a saint. Time, God's free grace is working in you to make you and me and all of us together, because none of us is in this alone, to make us an image of God for the world. Jacob sees God face to face in a, in a wrestling match of great mystery. And then the next morning, everyone gets to see the face of God in these two brothers weeping in each other's arms. The world will get to see the face of God in you, the messed up human being that you are, living out forgiveness. We have been made holy, and we are being made holy, renewed in our whole self. And sometimes uh, you'll want to give up on yourself. Sometimes you'll want to give up on other people, because man, is it hard. And sometimes we'll feel like God has given up on us. It's, it's part of the wrestling match, I think. But it'll never be true. God's grace has never and will never stop working on you. So receive that confidence. Trust that gift. And today and tomorrow, Go and continue the wrestling match. God won't let go of you. So don't let go of God. And even if you do, guess what? God won't let go of you. 
God helps those. You know what? You can end there. Amen. Our hymn of response is uh, number 682, Just As I Am. we come to you desperate but before we before we ask you or thank you for anything we come to you because you have come to us and so we thank you for that gift first that you are here by your Holy Spirit you are here among us we can shout or whisper we can think or or we can pray beyond what our, we can even form into words and you hear us because you are here thank you loving father for jesus thank you for your holy spirit and thank you for what you are doing in this world and in our lives thank you that we and the people around us and this whole beautiful creation does shine with your image that we can see your love and grace and freedom and truth everywhere we look 
Thank you for people that have helped us and people that we get to help. Thank you for the people that have taught us of your love. Thank you for the people that make us struggle. Thank you, Lord, that you are here. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust you with all things. We have needs. People we love have needs. Our world has needs that are beyond us. Lord, we ask for your help within our own hearts and minds. Help us in our struggles. Help us to find freedom from our own addictions. Forgiveness for our own grudges. Heal our, our families, our workplaces. Heal our churches. May we shine with your grace together. Lord, heal people that we know and love that are uh, struggling physically. Lord, each of us can name someone. Help those who are struggling in their minds and spirits. Give guidance to those who feel lost. Lord, help those who are oppressed and poor. Bring peace where there is war. Help those who've been driven from their homes by fires. And Lord, may your kingdom come in this world. There are so many other prayers we could offer and will offer through this week. Answer according to your grace and by your Spirit's power. And fill us with that power that we may leave this place full of your blessing to be an answer to prayer for others. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our last hymn this morning is number 461, Be Thou My Vision. Let's stand once more. <laughs> And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now 
and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.